morning. A bit of a mixed bag this morning, you might say. We're going to take a keen interest in a personal care home. We're going to have an unusual look at the most unusual hospital in British Columbia. And we're going to talk to a pol have an inquest on a politician. But first, a word on the particular rest home. I will have action to report to you following our reporting on the scabies outbreak in a rest home on West 15th in Vancouver, the Birch Rest Home. And I'll give you the specific details as soon as we get to that part of the program. After that, we go on a trip, a most unusual trip, to Riverview, to Riverside to be quite exact, we will look at what I used to know in my earlier reporting days as the most dreadful snake pit, and it really was a snake pit, in all of British Columbia. It's now called the Forensic Psychiatric Unit. Here is a man in a combative cell, combative cell. It's a quietening down cell. And this is the kind of program that will make you count your particular blessings. And then we're going to have an inquest. Who is responsible for the mess in this country today? Was it Pearson? Is it Trudeau? We might have a very good clinical look at that, and we shall take a particular inquest on the Pearson years with a book by Peter Stersberg on, what's his name, Lester Pearson and the Dream of Unity. Remember those days? Remember all the problems? Remember the initial appearance of uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau? And Stelsberg, who did a very good book in Diefenbecker too, should be able, I think, without weaseling, to give us some specific thoughts on Lester Pearson's dream of unity, which is just, it would seem, as far away as it ever was. But first this morning, we're going to do a little bit of a walkabout with my friend Dr. John Duffy of the Forensic Psychiatric Unit at Riverside. Seconds, and then we go up for the 17 seconds, voice over. 30. To tell you the honest truth, I was a little bit hesitant to go out to Riverside Colony Farm, as we used to know it, when it was a dreadful snake pit with hundreds of patients, many of them potentially very violent and under sedation. And I took a second thought. I thought, what right have we got to go and look at this particular place? The particular place has been there for years. The particular place is not that impressive in its accommodation. It's some like, somewhat like an old army barracks built at the beginning of the century. And it's now called something different. And we're going to meet John Duffy, the doctor. What a beautiful doll's house. I have for you today an excellent suggestion for Christmas present. Here is the sample art of a doll's house. And would you believe it? This house will cost you $25. And with the furniture, Beautiful handmade furniture, it will cost you an extra $6. That's $31. We may charge you sales tax. Where can you get a buy like this? I'm going to ask the manager of this uh, doll's house furniture factory to enter off stage my left. Do come in, doctor. Doctor, <laughs> this is Dr. John Duffy. And Dr. Duffy, when did you take up the business of manufacturing doll's houses? I didn't, Jack. This is the idea of the patients who decided they might as well do something interesting. Come over here, okay. you see in the doll's house, and yeah. face the camera this way. Okay. Right? Uh, what do you mean the patients decided? Whose patients? My patients. This Who are your patients? These are the patients in the maximum security hospital of the Forensic Psychiatry Institute near Riverview. And these are the patients that everyone thinks are dangerous and that we think are. Matter of fact, I think they're dangerous. I may have to be convinced otherwise. Come and see. But just a minute before we come and see, you were talking about the Forensic Psychiatric Institute. Yeah. What was the old name? The old name was Riverside or Colony Farm, because we have a farm here and the hospital's in the farm. And uh, I suppose an even better name would have been a snake pit. Matter of fact, I remember a number of years ago when it was undoubtedly a snake pit. And the top floor, which we'll go and see, was R3. That's right. Who was in R3? A collection of people who were unfit to stand trial, people who were not guilty by reason of insanity, people who were in for assessment, and people that other people didn't go on with. And people who were kept drugged because they were so dangerous at that time that they couldn't possibly leave them undrugged, undrugged because they might be a danger to the staff and other inmates. 
and were so closely packed they were falling over each other. Now in those days, as I recall, it must have been nine or ten years ago since I was here, there were about 400 odd patients jammed into R3, R2 and R1 in a place called the Annex. That's true. The Annex, the old white building. The old wooden building. How many patients have we got here now? About 110. Where are the others? Some have gone up to the mental hospital in Riverview, some have been discharged to the community, and some have been returned to the community. Now, what has been the miracle that has cut down, if there is such a thing, if I'm to believe you, Dr. Duffy, and after all, you are a psychiatrist, and therefore I must approach you with some credulous attitude. Yes. What is the miracle by which you've cut down the snake pit population of the old R3 from 400 to 110, 120? It's n nothing as mundane as a miracle. All that's happened is that everybody who's concerned with it, from the courts, the correctional institutes, welfare, rehab, probation, everybody has now decided to work together so that the population that we're dealing with is dealt with correctly. All that happened in the old days was that this was benign neglect. Because these people were under corrections, under the courts, under other agencies, everyone was afraid to touch them. And because they weren't touched and weren't being going anywhere, they became dangerous and violent. They were neglected. Mm -hmm. All that's happened now is that we've applied normal psychiatric principles to the treatment of this group of patients. Now, I, know, I can think of a number of horror cases by which men who have killed their wives, their wives and their children with axes or shotguns and whatnot, yeah. and they're unfit to stand trial because of their mental condition, yes. and they're put away as order and counsel patients in your care. Yes. How can you decide to release such a person, even if on the face of it, after some years, they are apparently placid? The first point is that uh, if you ignore the method of killing, murder is a family matter. It's Say that again? Murder is a family matter. The population think of murder as murder in the commission of a violent crime, of a mafia. Murder is a family matter between people who can't get on well. And to a certain extent, anyone who has killed his family has solved that problem. And you will never have another family. You only have one parent. That's a particularly, you'd forgive me if I said particularly, could I say brutal or callous attitude? You could say factual. A man who has murdered his family has solved that problem. Right. He will never cause that problem again. The problem is gone. Unless he marries again and murders no. another family. No, because the second marriage never lasts long enough there has to be a time for the development of the bad relationship that led to murder. You'll tell me more on the way around. I want to finish on a happy note about the dolls' houses. How many have you produced? I think they're running into the 20s already, but they have some with electric lights, so they're going haywire. Are the you take the orders for them? Yes. And the price is only 25 bucks. Well, that's until tonight. We'll double it for you. <laughs> Everywhere the locked doors, everywhere this old barrack room atmosphere in the place. It really is a shame that we should have that. Now we're going to a different section of the unit altogether. We're just wandering along the corridors and on the side are what they call these, uh, what do they call them? Side rooms, where they used to keep the patients drugged in the bad old days. I mean, if I have a punch up with my wife and they say 30 days psychiatric examination while I come here, you would, but they probably wouldn't send you for a psychiatric examination just for that kind of thing. But I'm... Um, uh, don't worry about that. Now, so therefore, here is remand. Now, yes. 30 days always stretches to six weeks or two months, doesn't it? Not in this place. As soon as the remand's finished, the person's returned to court. And it can be as little as three days, and the average is 14.7. But I thought you had great problems with doctors. I mean, numbers and quantities. No. Well, what's your average? Again? 14.7. You're telling me that by and large, it's four, if I'm up for psychiatric remand on a major indictable offence, I will not be in here for more than 15 days. On the average? On the average. In the 15 days, we can complete all the examinations that we would like to have. Uh, for example, we can do psychological testing and have the testing finished, and we can report back to the court after you've gone back. Supposing I'm unfit to stand trial okay. at that time? In that case, then we go back to court and there's a trial of the issue of fitness. And we appear in court and give psychiatric evidence 
and your defence lawyer is able to cross-examine us and say, why do you think my client is unfit? And then, uh, supposing I'm found unfit, unfit then, to plead. In that case, the judge or magistrate makes out what's called a warrant of committal. And the warrant of committal returns you to this institute until the pleasure of the Lieutenant Governor is known. That means we come to be an order and council patient. No, you're not an order and council patient until the Cabinet has issued an order and council. I'm um, temporary committal in the meantime. Yes. You would only become an order and council patient if you were unfit for a long time and you'd gone through other safeguards, such as the Board of Review. Now, just a minute. Once I'm in here for my psychiatric examination, am I locked in up here in R3 West you're all the time? Completely locked in in strict custody because you've been remanded in strict custody from the court. Fair enough. Fair enough. One of the remarkable things about the place these days is the apparent lack of security staff. No heavies. As I keep saying, it's like an old army barracks without the soldiers, you might say. It's not the nicest place in the world, I'll tell you. Here I go with Duffy again, Dr. Duffy. Here we are in the, used to be the infamous, notorious, celebrated R3, right? That's true. This was the place that I used to hear all the horror stories about, which was the same place. It's still a horror no, this is the place where people are admitted once they've been found not guilty of reason and sanity. And where we used to have 80 people in here, there are now at the most 24. What kind of crimes? Usually we're talking of killing of a family member or theft over 200, that kind of thing. There's not much of a comparison, is there, between killing of a family member and theft over 200? But that's, that's the kind of thing that people do. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the kind How long will we stay in here? If they're suffering from a mental illness, and if we're bringing the mental illness under control, we can look for them either being fit to go back to trial or to go into another ward that's improved within three months. Now, nobody can hear us at the moment. These, this is the ward where you might say, as an outsider, I would be fearful of the most dangerous prisoners. Sure. On the basis of the records. Yes. Now, we went through the business about drugs before, but what, what do you do about security? We don't have any security staff. Oh, come now, Doctor. None at all. Well, how can you do that? We do that because our security is a contract between our psychiatric nurses and the patient. And the patient sees the psychiatric nurse as a friend who's going to help them with the illness. And we teach the patient reality. We say to them, the community doesn't like you. The community has sent you in here. And if you escape, the community will return you instantly. The only way you'll ever get back to the community is if you change and if you improve. He said no security. We've gone through half a dozen locked doors today. There are only a couple of keys on them, that's all. What about the windows? The windows are barred, but they were barred when the building was built. Well, that's the only reason they're barred? That's the only reason. And you're surrounded by water, I think, on two or three sides. Yeah, but that's serendipity. We didn't design it that way. And our escapes are very interesting. Most of our escapes are people who are getting better, who want to be in town for a little while, and the statistics always show that the mental patients who escape, return to the community, do better in the long run than those who don't try. Oh, but let them escape and don't tell the public about it. Did you hear what I said? The patients getting better are the ones who tend to escape. But what's impressed me about Duffy, Dr. Duffy, on this occasion, was that they do teach the patients reality. They say to them quite bluntly, you can't go, you won't get out until you face reality. And reality is a certain pattern of behavior to which you must conform. Now we're going downstairs, again like an old prison cell or something, into, I think we're going to R2 now, to have a look at some of the other activities in the forensic psychiatric unit at Riverside, the old colony farm. All the corridors look the same, all the rooms look the same. A different area of the hospital, one floor below R2. Yes. Now, are these uh, mental patients on the mend? Are there any council patients on the mend, or are they a different category altogether? Legally, they're a different category, because everybody on this floor has been cleared for safe custody. Mm -hmm. That means they can work on the farm, they have restricted privileges, and it means that their mental illness has been controlled and contained, and they're working in programs to return them to society. But some of them... Can, the, can anyone on the final analysis be returned to society? Have you got anyone here who cannot, in your opinion, ever be returned to society? I think we might have three or four. That's all. Three or four? <laughs> no names, no pipe drill. I saw one chap here who had, you know, pretty bad incidents in the past. Mm -hmm. Will he ever die? 
He might. He's been improving steadily for four years. But once a man gets down here, even though he's still under the council, yes. he's outside working, yes. on the farm, or whatever, yes. and uh, can qualify for release. Yes, he can. The question I didn't ask you upstairs. You have, as, he, as such, you don't have any heavies from the criminal underworld. We used to have one or two interesting people who had pasts associated with Al Capone, mm -hmm. but they've all died off. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, uh, I don't know of any heavies from the underworld. We have people who have become mentally ill in prison. Ah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. A person's convicted of a crime and becomes mentally ill. The transferred immediately to us for treatment. When they have finished the treatment, they go back to prison. Ah, but you're only talking about provincial prisons. Provincial prisons. Supposing I'm a mental case in the BC Pen, where do I go? You go to the Regional Medical Centre at Metz. Metz, yes. That's not quite as advanced as this place in treatment, is it? Oh, it's exactly the same. Exactly the same, yes. Now, you doctors, how many of the staff do you have in the Forensic Psychiatric Institute as, you mean, for many doctors do you have? We've got one physician and ten psychiatrists. And where are they? Are they all here at no, Colony Farm? The only one here is the physician. Oh. Every other doctor visits. Visits where? Throughout the province? Here, throughout the whole province. They do the whole service for the whole province. If I'm a man who's been in here with some condition after some crime or yes. whatnot, and I go back to someplace up country, yes. your man comes to see me up there? What will happen is that the nurse who looks after you may accompany you up country to investigate whether it's safe to let you there, where you're going to live, how you're going to work. And we have to make arrangements that you'll come to a certain clinic for follow-up. Mm -hmm. And we may require visits back down to the lower mainland. But we have people who have been able to live outside the province and come Do back. Do you down. have, uh, you sound like you're a happy government servant. Lots of staff. Mm -hmm. Are you? Yeah. No shortage of staff? No. Get all you need? No. Yep. Budget satisfactory? Yep. The only thing is this antiquated, antediluvian army barracks type accommodation. Yeah. We're trying to teach the patients to blow it down. <laughs> Careful what you say <laughs> now. You mean like the... What was it, the, the Three Little Pigs? The Three Little Pigs. Blow it down. <laughs> we'll ask you what you want in a minute. But I want the, I want the viewers to see the, the dreadful dormitories. Okay. Upstairs, downstairs, you've got these dreadful dormitories. Anyway, don't cry. <laughs> right. A number of the patients recognized me when we were going through R3 and R2. And I said hello to a goodly number of them. And there was one man I particularly wanted to talk to. He's been in Riverside a long, long time. And a very easy chap to talk to, as you will see. And a remarkably healthy outlook when you consider the fact that my old friend, Patient X, you'll hear how long he's been living in this restricted climate. How long have you been in here? Oh, getting on close to 15 years now, I'd say. 15 years. Now, you're, uh, you, have a f you have some freedom, don't you? Uh, I have privileges. I can uh, go up to the hill, for instance. Well, what do you do up there? Well, there's a cafe and a tuck shop. There, on Friday nights, there's dances. And on Saturdays or Sundays, I have my option of uh, watching sports and TV. And what about working? What, what do you do? Well, I work over in the dairy mm -hmm. on the farm, and uh, one of the reasons I like it there is, of course, uh, not just for the honor, but for the dough. Oh, how much you get? I got 60 bucks a month there. 60 bucks a month. Plus, I get $40 a month comfort allowance. So you have 100 bucks a month. Yeah. And uh, can you get into town if you want to on occasion? Well, no. Uh, I have the hours. I have gone to town on my own, but I've managed to return within the hours allotted me there sober. In other words, you, they'll say they'll give you 12 hours or an eight hour pass or something. Oh, no. no. It's really, uh, uh, we have grounds from uh, on the weekends from shortly a minute after 12 until 4 in the afternoon, depending on the time of year. You so see. you can use that time to your best advantage, providing you keep to the time? Yeah, mm -hmm. roughly, yeah. Well, you know, uh, how long you, did you say you'd been in I've here? I've been here close to 15 years. How do you feel after all these years? 
Well, uh, I feel as though I'm up and at him. Uh, I was the so sort of a guy uh, I played hard on the field when I played professional I sports, mean, but I was too soft off the field. However, I was confident I from like, this point of view well, that I gave it all to the best of my ability. Look, I like your attitude. That's good of you, Jack. I like yours. Well, what do you I think? What do you think? Do you think the deal will come in the not too distant future when you can get signed out in a way? Most certainly, I would say so. And you'll be as happy as a lot, okay? Well, uh, I, w I would say so. Can you stay away from the, b the bottle? Yes. Yes, I can. You can uh, get a couple of beers over at the pub here. Oh, yes, but I don't go over there in a way. I'm fussy who I drink with. <laughs> Best of luck. Thanks, Jack. Nice to see you. You know. That was Patient X. We didn't get a chance to show you the pub which the patients themselves are building, where they have a maximum of two, two bottles of beer on certain occasions. But I want to finish with uh, Dr. John Duffy, the director of the psychiatric unit, and the Dolls' Houses. Dr. Duffy, we're back where we started with the Dolls' Houses. Yep. Except that this time we're in the OT. Is that what you call it? Occupational therapy, that's okay. right. You know, it's uh, the little things that grab me. I see all kinds of dangerous weapons, chisels, hammers, big wrenches and whatnot, and you're trying to disabuse me that anybody here is dangerous. Not only are they not dangerous, Jack, but no one has ever used any of these tools to attack anybody, and no one has ever been released from here has ever attacked anyone. No one ever? No one ever. Our release patients behave exactly the same as the rest of the population. They may be head up for drunken driving, they may be head up for theft, but they don't attack people. Why do they come in here? Because in many cases they were violent in the first place. That's right. But when they're released, they're really violent. They've learned a lesson. Seems to be the case. It's not a question of curing, uh, is it? No, I think it's a question that they know that everything they do in, in society from now on is being watched. And that extra little supervision seems to Why be... Why should I have faith in your system of watching, though? I mean, I really don't, unless you... You don't have faith yeah, in me. Cynic, not in you particularly. No, no, but. you don't. You look at the statistics year after year, and they're the same the world over. The statistics are very easy. If a person has committed crimes before a mental illness came on, and they're released from a place like this, they will commit the same crimes as they used to commit. If they haven't committed crimes until they had the mental illness, when the mental illness is treated, the only things they will ever do are the product of the mental illness. OK, criticism from me. You've, you've Give me a fairly broad story today, but uh, your accommodation here, these old army type barrack dormitories are quite abominable. Yes. Why do you put up with them? I mean, there you've got what? 15, 16, 17 bare beds in rooms. Yes. And some men are maybe a little bit disturbed, pacing up and down. Some men are quite copacetic, but that's a dreadful way to live. They wouldn't put up with that in a penitentiary, would they? Come back next year, Jack, and we'll show you the buildings that we're going to erect. What kind? We're going to erect modular buildings. You mean mobile home things? Mobile home things. And we're going to give people as close an approximation to home as possible, every person to have a room of his own. What will you do with this barn? We'll think of a use. Blow it away. <laughs> Thanks very much, Doc. <coughs> Thank you. What a difference. What a difference. From 10 years ago, 400 patients doped and lying in side rooms to 120. Mind you, Duffy, Dr. Duffy's a very convincing man. I don't think the public is yet totally convinced, but as he said, the facts must speak for themselves. If you try and get the reality into the patients and if they can conform to ordinary norms, and if, as he says, in the case of the people on the other side, where it's murder, that murder is a family matter and not going to be done again, perhaps uh, they have the answer. And I must uh, say something I've never, ever heard a civil servant say before that he is a happy civil servant. My thanks to Patient X for watching this morning and to John Duffy and the, the people who cooperated in our walkabout at the Forensic Psychiatric Unit in the Riverside section of Riverview. Now, back to old clothes and political porridge. Lester Pearson, used to love him dearly, but I suppose that Peter Stersberg can destroy him for us when we talk about his book on Lester Pearson's dream and the dream of unity. I want to use the dormitories later on after I do the Birch and Maple Rest Home. It's just a short shot on the dorms.
Yeah, go on like gangbusters. Oh, terrific. It was very good. That was most interesting. Elsa, Terrible price on the Elsa Franklin told me we couldn't possibly do 90 minutes a day. All right, I'll, I'll do it. No, I'll do it. That's all. That's great. Heard, uh, Lester Pearson, Lester B. Pearson, civil servant, diplomat, ton prime minister. A guy who I suppose gave Canada its best reputation in world affairs. Not quite so flashy or flamboyant as uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, of course, but a good, solid, sober kind of guy. But behind that, Lester Pearson was something else again. And Peter Sturzberg, has written, you, you're churning up books out like Burton these days, aren't you? You did the two books in Diefenbaker recently in which you adopted a new technique. Now tell yes. me about that technique yes. before we talk about the Pearson book. It's called Living History. In other words, uh, what I do is I interview the people around P Pearson, the people around Diefenbaker. These are political books, mind you. They're all people in the pol political process and uh, the people that were involved in the period, and they tell the story of the period. I don't tell it. Oh, you do a kind of Barry Bradfoot? Yes, exactly. In a way, it's a Barry Bradfoot, yes. who only, interviews all the old soldiers and writes about the war. Yes, the only trouble with Barry Bradfoot is uh, that, uh, and I know Barry very well, that the people are unidentified. Here, the people are identified. This is their views, and they are the main movers and shakers of the times. Now, let's get back to the dream of unity. Pearson. Under which government was it that we started off with that incredible B and B, the biculturalism it was, under Davidson Dunton? Well, it was all Lester Pearson. Uh, you know, uh, people blame Trudeau for bilingualism, but P Trudeau didn't start it. It was Lester B. Pearson that began it, and he began it with a speech when he was still in opposition, in which he pledged that when he came to power, he would bring in bilingualism. And then he set up the B&B &B Commission, and then he started uh, bilingualism first in the civil service. And after that, of course, he quit, and Mr. Trudeau has carried the ball since. Well, that was one of his big things, and some, some people might think that was the greatest boo-boo of all. Yeah. Do you think that was the greatest boo-boo of all? The way in which he set the nation on a course which now has not undoubtedly caused great division on the... Uh, bilingualism, the equal opportunity for all Canadians to speak to their federal government and their founding language. Well, I will tell you this, that I think that it Who might have been... Who pushed him into it? It was, uh, well, you know, Pearson was a, was a diplomat, as you said, and he became a politician late in life. And he, as a diplomat, he relied on advisors, particularly as far as Quebec was concerned. And he had two series of advisors. You've got to remember this. He had a, the, uh, the Morris Sauvé, uh, who wasn't very close to him, but the main one was Maurice Lamontagne and also, of course, Guy Favreau. That was at the beginning. And it was Maurice Lamontagne who was the, uh, the author of the bilingual pledge. And he was really the architect of the bilingual policy. But the irony is but that by the time that they brought in the bilingual policy, Maurice Lamontagne was out. He, uh, he, he had fallen from grace because of the so-called scandal. Oh, the furniture deals. Yes, the furniture deal. You're right. And then in came, in 1965, another three French Canadians, Marchand, Trudeau, and Peltier. Now, Peltier had very little to do with Pearson. But Marchand and Trudeau became his main advisors. Marchand took over uh, the mantle of Guy Favreau. He became the Quebec lieutenant. Trudeau became Mr. Pearson's parliamentary secretary and his anointed son. And was not Marchand first intended to be the anointed son? Exactly, he was. But because was. of personality and other problems, Mr. Marchand was not available for the job. Yes, I think that one of the main reasons was that he couldn't speak English well enough. Yeah, now, okay, that's the dream of unity. And he thought that bilingualism would solve the, the Canadian problem of Well, division. I was going to go on to say this, that the dream of unity, of, or at least bilingualism, became a Frankenstein monster. And it became a Frankenstein monster even at the very beginning. And I have, uh, you know, I, the, the chapter 
which is described as the French solution here in, the, in this book. Right. The, the chapter points out that Maurice Lamontagne, who by this time was out in the wings, mm -hmm. he had, uh, had been appointed to the Senate, came down, was horrified at what was happening over bilingualism, at the way that the, uh, the civil servants were taking this to the extremes. And he names names. He says that people like Robertson and Carson, by the way, Carson came from Vancouver. Public Service Commission. Yeah. And if he didn't know them better, he would have believed, uh, and of course this is a nice way of getting around this, that they did this deliberately in order to sabotage the program. This is what he says in, That's what in the book. That's what Lamontagne says. Yes, Lamontagne says. Carson you know, Robertson. all this business of yeah. trying to educate 55 years old Judges. to speak French, and then buying 20 houses in Quebec City and giving Robertson, he says, uh, a year's, uh, you know, scholarship there with family. He, say, he called it a $100,000 scholarship. This was all crazy. This was the thing that and began well, Lamont to destroy Lamontan actually says in your book that, yes. he that at one time he thought it was sabotage of the original modest proposals. That's right. That's right. Fascinating. And uh, so, you see... I, have the lawyers checked the book? Oh, of course. <laughs> I want to bully you like. I want to bully you like. <laughs> but listen, there was another one which I want to get into. Yeah. I remember well the heat and the furor on the flag. It's all yes. gone now. Yes. Was yeah. that the one thing in which Pearson was truly successful, you think? Yes. As far as unity is concerned. Well, he, uh, he, he was certainly successful there. Now, Tom Kent, who was his main advisor, you remember Tom Kent. You know where he is now? No. He's in uh, Nova Scotia, in Cape Breton, and he's running Cisco, which is the steel corporation. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Is that a crown corporation? Yes, it's a crown corporation. You know, a political maximum you must use sometime or give to Colombo is... It matters not that you won or lost, but for whom you played the game. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Hold your breath, yes. Peter. We're going to come back and talk more about your book and take some phone calls from uh, Pearson Fields. Is that what they're called? People Pearson who support Fields, Pearson? who love Pearson. Who love Pearson. Isn't that guy? Isn't that guy? There's your book, Lester Pearson and the Dream of Unity. We were talking about the flag, but before we get back to the flag, how many people did you interview for their first person versions of their involvements with, uh, with Pearson? Pearson? 66 altogether. Click All his click. cabinet ministers, except for two, and they were both dead. Well, that was difficult. You couldn't really do that. <laughs> how about my old buddy? I shouldn't laugh about how that. How about my old buddy, right. Judy Lamarche? Judy is Lamarche is right in, the in there. Oh, yes. And how mad she was at Pearson. She wanted to be a judge, you know, and Pearson wouldn't give her. That was after she was defeated. Oh, no. No, no, no. Oh, no. when this she was, was in the before, cabinet? Yes. This is when she told Pearson that she was going to retire at the same time as Pearson. You know, Pearson. Everyone knew that Pearson was going to retire for about two years before he did. And uh, she told Pearson that she was going to retire at the same time as he, and that she wanted a, uh, a, a Supreme Court as, judgeship. A, a judge. Yeah, nothing less than a Supreme Court for judgeship. And he said no. He and what did she settle right. for? A hotline radio show <laughs> yes, on a in minor Vancouver. station in Vancouver. <laughs> yes. And she fell flat on her face on the show, said Webster with a snide grimace. You know. But what does she say about Trudeau? Do you go back over her incredible yes, remarks about yes, Trudeau? Yes, she has, you know, how she uh, called him a 
bastard. That's all in That's here. allowed as a reporter. You can't no. use it as an expletive, but you can say that she no. called him that well, bastard. Well, that's all in here because I have a, a, a chapter on the Trudeau succession. And also what comes out of this chapter is the fact that Pearson did want Trudeau. That he, he, you know, quietly but quite clearly, Trudeau was his anointed son. But in those days, we were still hoist with the petard that after an English Canadian, you had to have a French Canadian. This is what uh, uh, Pearson felt. Yes. Well, Peltier being a very much committed left winger, more so than. Uh, well, Peltier wasn't really in it because nobody. Marchand uh, was yeah, a Labour leader. Marchand was. Marchand. Was so yes. that's what. And then Marchand, there were personal reasons why Marchand didn't want to run, and Marchand picked Trudeau. Peter Stasberg, you've been in the gallery in Ottawa for 110 years, mm -hmm. or 20 anyway. No, no, not 110. 20. 22. 22. Yeah. Did Trudeau pick, in your honest opinion, the wrong man? For what? Prime Minister of Canada to follow him as leader of the Liberal Party. Oh, I thought you said Trudeau. You oh, sorry, Pearson. my mistake. Pearson, yes. my mistake. Did Pearson pick the wrong, the wrong man? wrong man. Mm -hmm. Did he? Well, I, you know, I think that that uh, is still for history to decide. But I would say this, that there's no question about it, that Trudeau uh, was uh, upset Mr. Pearson very much indeed, not so much about his national policies, but because he changed the foreign policy. But was there not something else that comes back to my brain about some way in which Trudeau snubbed Pearson? Yes. What well, was the snap? Well, this was over foreign policy. Oh. Yes. This was, you see, he brought in the white papers, you remember, on foreign policy, and he ignored Pearson. And this really upset Pearson. Well, this was when the old man was then in retirement That's and out right. of the House of Commons. That's right. And the moment Trudeau took over, that was that. Yes. And Finished you know, with Trudeau wanted to bring in a neutralist foreign policy. This is all going to be in my second volume, though. We're, t we're talking about the first volume. Mm. <laughs> You see, the second volume of my uh, Pearson books is going to be about Pearson as a diplomat. Now, we, uh, do you cover in your book the incredible gaffe, or perhaps it was deliberate, the Munsinger affair? Mm -hmm. How did it's that it. slip out? Well, it was a, a, a you know, this, this was the real trouble with Pearson. Well, was in case, you've, very, in case yeah. you've forgotten, listeners, Gerda Munsinger was the woman who was publicly associated with a certain one-legged cabinet minister in the Conservative Pierre government. Pierre Sevigny. Yeah. Pierre Sevigny. Yeah. But the story did not come out about Diefenbaker's handling of that affair until the Liberals were in office and under severe pressure on, on the George Victor Spencer spy affair. Yeah. Tell me right. what happened. Yes, well, the Conservatives and uh, feel that this was done deliberately in order to take the pressure off them that Pearson did this deliberately. And I think there's a lot to that. I think that the, so I say that in he in wasn't there. a bland, a, a Oh, no, no. This, this book shows uh, uh, Pearson as a much more complex figure uh, than, uh, you know, the sort of wise-cracking sportsman diplomat. Baseball fan. Yeah, he was a, quite an emotional guy. There are, uh, there are more than one occasion here in this book where people tell how he broke down and cried. You wouldn't believe that, would you, of Pearson? No, because he wasn't even a drinker, was he? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously speaking, What's you're telling me... What's crying got to do with drinking? You're telling me, well, in Scotch we have an expression called greet and drunk. <laughs> oh, I see. Not in our family, but in other families. I see. Uh, but I remember this well, that the, the Liberals were under heavy attack on the George Victor Spencer spy affair, the post office yes. fellow who wasn't charged. And then, of course, this thing slipped out. Uh, the, Who the was it that got up Cardin, and talked? Cardin let it out. About the Monsignor uh, Monsignor. Affair. And the whole fact of the matter was that Pearson had got the file from the RCMP at the time of the Rivard affair. He'd asked the RCMP to look into any, uh, you know, misdemeanors on the part of ministers and he had the file there all the time. Now, Cardin, of course, was the justice minister, and it's presumed that Cardin saw the file. He didn't read it very well. This file showed... He, he called her Monsignor, if you remember rightly. And he thought she was dead, and, or, you know, he made an awful... awful this file movie. showed, or rather gave the Liberals some ammunition, that Mr. Diefenbaker had not handled it the way they said it should be handled, the, uh, the seven year scandals. Yes, that's what they claim. And mention of the Rivard affair. Remember that one? Yes, oh my yes, good. Definitely. That was the night the drug dealer got out to put on 
the former skating rink when the temperature was 40 degrees. That's right, to water fashion. the skating rink. To water the skating <laughs> when rink. When it was 40 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And, uh, and Mr. Diefenbaker made tremendous uh, mileage out of that during the 1965 election campaign. I remember the well. I mean, you know, you remember, I mean, he would all, practically always start with that story. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, good fun doing these books. Good cooperation from all these people. Oh, yes. Politicians like to talk. Well, sometimes they don't tell the truth, though. Well, I, of course, this is a fact, and this is what historian, historians hate these books, you know. They hate them. And the fact is, though, and I will admit that memories are selective. You know, you're, you're going to remember what was best as I remember far as you what I concerned. want to remember. Yes, you want what you want to remember. But if you have enough people recalling a certain incident or a certain person, I think you get the full story then. Okay, we're going to take some calls to Peter Stasberg. Right. On politics. Right. You're still actively involved in covering the nation, are you? No, I'm writing books. Writing today. books. I'm more concerned about the past, but then, of course, the present becomes the past. Stelsberg and Webster on the phones. You want to tell me that story on the air? Good. A call from where? South Slocan? Go ahead, ma'am or sir. I'd like to ask Mr. Stersberg if he thinks that bilingualism is possible. <laughs> now, you, you write books, you've got to come up with a firm, concrete answer on that, Peter. No, I don't think it is po possible. Uh, I don't think that there is such a thing as a bilingual country. I think that bilingualism is possible for the individual. I think that there are quite a lot of bilingual individuals, but I think that bilingualism as a policy is not a possible, no. In other words, it's a, it's a gesture, it's a yeah. tip of the hat. Well, it's a, it's a hope. Uh, it's a political move. Yeah, I think bilingualism is uh, creating a lot of prejudices. Like I seen an article a few weeks ago, somebody had a flag they printed up, it had nine beavers urinating on a frog. I mean, if bilingualism does come through. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that really is quite disgusting, though. I mean, we don't need that kind of irritation. We've got enough No, but I think that there's no question about it. The way that Trudeau has taken this policy to the extreme, I don't say this a Pearson. Do you think he knows that he's taking it to the extreme? Uh, or no, don't you think, I doubt it. I doubt it. Don't is you it? think that maybe, the Laman, not Lamentin, yes, Lamentin is correct that the civil servants and the mandarins have pushed it beyond any reason? That's right. That's right. And I think that, P P uh, that Trudeau is doing the same. Go ahead, uh, Peter Stersberg. Where are you? Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, is it possible to speak with Jack Wesp, sir? Not until after 10.30, my dear, unless you want to talk to Peter Stersberg. A uh, part of me? No. Would you attend to that young lady? Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Who am I talking to? Jack Webster and Peter Stasberg. Right. Uh, this is for Peter. Yes. Yeah. Hello, my name is Peggy Morrison. Oh, my gosh. An old friend. From Victoria. From... Yeah. And I love him dearly. Uh, this is the second time I've heard him. I love his brother, Richard. <laughs> and as for you, Jack Webster, you <laughs> misquoted something. What did I misquote? You said all clothes and porridge, and you should have said all clays and porridge. Depends from which level of society you come, my dear. Pardon me? In our family, we say old clothes and porridge, unless we're greeting drunk, in which we say old clays and porridge. Yeah, my father was from Aberdeen. Well, I'm just fascinated by your intensely political contribution, and I'm very <laughs> grateful indeed that you've expressed your love for <laughs> Peter Sturzberg and all the other Sturzbergs. <laughs> and ma'am, these calls from Victoria just entrance me beyond belief. <laughs> Peter, do you, would you want to give her a message, Peter? Well, I just want to say I want to return her love. <laughs> okay, Peter. Thank you. You have the most delightful friends. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Mr. Sturzberg, please. Yes, yeah. yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sturzberg, two questions. Uh, I worked with uh, Brother Dick and Courtney in the late 30s. My God, these are all friends of the family. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wasn't anticipating the previous call. <laughs> Do carry on. Why yeah. did you tell me what happened to Dick? Well, he's not in the book, is no, he? No, he's not in the book. <laughs> he's not in the book, and he's He's fine. here in Vancouver. <laughs> and thank you very much. 
Peter, tell me a couple of stories. You have not excited the telephone audience this morning, or perhaps it's me. No. Anyway, tell me a couple Well, there's the a wonderful story. story there about Vive le Quebec Libre. After General de Gaulle... One had, always laughs at that story. Yeah, yeah. It only smashed the nation. Yeah. <laughs> well, when, uh, when uh, General de Gaulle had been ordered out of the country, you see, it so happened that on the very day that he was ordered out, there was supposed to be a great dinner for him at Government House. You see, he was supposed to have come to Ottawa oh, yeah. and, and have this dinner. And uh, Roley Michener learned about this. He was the Governor General at the time. And apparently, uh, he had a very irascible cook or chef called Zonda. And uh, Roley was so afraid of the chef that he sent Mrs. Michener down to tell the chef that there was going to be no dinner <laughs> on the morning of the dinner. So she went down there and told Zonda, who was busily preparing these magnificent desserts, you see, with uh, tricola, uh, spun in, in, in sugar and so on like that. And uh, she said uh, to Zonda, I'm sorry, sir, uh, but, there is, but the general is not coming to dinner. And Zonda said, zoot, and smashed his fist onto one <laughs> of these desserts, and then onto another, and then onto another, until finally he'd spent all his energy and his fury. That's rather nice. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Um, Mr. Sternberg. Yes, Sternberg. Speaking. Um, mm. I'm directing my question to you. Yep. What is your opinion of having a benevolent and intelligent dictator surrounded by a coterie of intelligent advisors as opposed to what apparently is a Mickey Mouse system we have at this time. Well, who are you referring to? Are you, ex uh, are you referring to Trudeau as a benevolent dictator? No, he's referring to Trudeau as the leader of a Mickey Mouse troop. Oh, I see, I see. Well, I don't think that uh, that's the right way of doing things in any case. I mean, this is a democratic system, and I think that we can surely make the democratic system work. Um, uh, excuse me, may I interrupt here? You say um, that you think it's a democratic system, and surely we can make the democratic system work, um, implying that um, the democratic system is not working. Well, I don't think it. Uh, I, I, I would. I didn't really mean that. I think that the democratic system does work. It has its failings. One of the reasons why uh, Trudeau and the Liberals have been in power for so long is that they have this power base in Quebec. And uh, as long as they represented Quebec, and as long as there were enough people in English Canada to go along with them, which happened, of course, in Lester Pearson's time, uh, then the Liberals are going to win. So you would... Um, uh, what the man is trying to get you to say, but uh, in a reverse kind of way, is that democracy as we know it doesn't work, and what we need is a benevolent dictator. Well, I won't agree with that. Well, no, we can't accept that, because in fact, under the British parliamentary system, as used in Canada, with a powerful prime minister and a collection of Mickey Mouse cabinet ministers, you do have, in fact, a benevolent dictatorship. Yes, I suppose you Not that's necessarily true. benevolent. Thank you very much, sir. Peter, uh, I wish you best of luck work <laughs> with Lester Pearson and the Dream of Unity. You Good. couldn't whip up a storm today in this part of the world on the Dream of Unity. People are sick and tired of the political convolutions. But as an anecdotal yeah. book, I shall yeah. read it and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Makes a good Christmas present. You were talking about these dolls' houses. Books are better Christmas presents. Seventeen ninety-five. Yeah. Oh, gee, it was all. Thank you, Peter. Right. Go to break. <laughs> On the 2nd of November, we broke a story here which was of considerable social significance in British Columbia. And that was an expose from some confidential documents about conditions in personal care homes in British Columbia and in some private hospitals. I cannot yet report to you everything that happened, uh, but we're watching for action by the government authorities on the complaints raised on behalf of, by government investigators, behalf of patients under the long-term care. By no means is everything settled yet. 
by no means of conditions being cleaned up. But I'm going to give you one particular piece of news about this rest home. After I remind you of what I said on the morning of 2nd November, this is where the story real, really came to life for me. I went in to see old John in his room in the Birch Rest Home. There he was alone, 92, half blind, half deaf, with his brother's empty bed beside him, trying to sort out his somewhat pathetic possessions for his trip back to Sweden. Now, how did they get here in the first place? That's one thing that requires some looking into. John and 92, as I say, and Carl, his 86-year-old brother, had been moved by some person trying to be helpful from the Regent Hotel, where they had lived for a quarter of a century or more, into the Birch Rest Home. What nobody knew or bothered to find out or was able to ascertain, that between them, they have assets in this country, because they saved every nickel they made as loggers through the years, of close on, if not more than 300,000.